Welcome to Hope Church Online. My name is Mark Jordan. I'm the pastor here at Hope Church, and I'm thrilled that you are worshiping with us on this Sunday after Easter. Hopefully you had an opportunity last week to check out our Easter message. It was entitled Easter Outside. And one of the main takeaways from that message was about the stone that was rolled in front of the tomb where Jesus was laid. I talked about how that stone was not rolled away so that Jesus could get out, but so that we could see in. And as a result of that, what Christ did through his sacrificial death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave was he enabled us, every single one, to be able to come to him on equal ground. So it doesn't matter what's in our background, what we're doing, what's in our past. We have the ability and the opportunity to come to him as we are, warts and all, so that we can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that we are his and he wants us in his eternal heart and life forever. And I made a point while we were talking about that, about uh, Jesus did not need that stone to be rolled away because he was no longer bound by uh, the nature of physics or the laws of physics. He did not need that stone to be rolled away so that he could get out. And in that, I mentioned that we would look a little bit further into the Gospel of John to get another clue. And so we're going to pick up with that again today in our message, which is entitled uh, Dealing with Doubts from the Gospel of John verses, uh, chapter 20 verses 19 through 31. And so I want, as we get into this, I want you to think about how it is that John gives us that cue and that clue that the door was locked, yet Jesus uh, did not have to abide by the laws of physics anymore, and he just appeared there. So let's pick it up, and then we're going to dig into uh, the account of Thomas, who many of us know with the moniker Doubting Thomas. But anyway, let's dig into it. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. I'm reading from the New International Version. On the evening of that first day of the week, When the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive someone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, remember Jesus was pierced with the spear. Thomas said, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. John closes his gospel with these words. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is God's word for God's people. Let's give thanks to God. Amen. Amen. All right, so we get the stage set. It's still Easter Sunday as the passage begins, and Jesus appears to the disciples in the midst of the locked room. And then we fast forward a week later when Thomas is there with the disciples because he wasn't there the previous week, and we see the same basic event begin to unfold. Jesus appears in the room with the disciples even though the doors are locked. And it is in this point that we see this convergence of doubt and belief really begin to get manifest in the relationship that Jesus had with Thomas as well as the other disciples. Now, Thomas, as I mentioned when we got started, does have that moniker of doubting Thomas. And I think sometimes we're unfair to Thomas. If we were to put ourselves in that situation on Easter Sunday morning when Jesus appears to the disciples and Thomas isn't there, and all of a sudden all the disciples are saying, we've seen the Lord. Jesus has been here in the flesh. It's real. 
Thomas did not have the, the privilege of experiencing the same presence with Christ that the rest of the disciples had. And that was a little bit of an impediment for him. And you can almost feel in those words that we get in the first part of our passage, you could almost feel as though Thomas is yearning to believe. He wants to believe. He hears the testimony of the other disciples, what they've witnessed. And, and Thomas, with all of his heart and his mind, I believe, really wants to believe that Jesus was there. And that a whole week passes. Well, a whole week now has passed between this morning and, and last Easter Sunday. What has happened to you in a week? In some ways, with all the COVID calamity going on, it's almost as though Easter was a month of Sundays ago, but it was really just a week. And so much has happened within this last week, but we still are, are brought back to this moment, this point in time, when we, much like Thomas, have to make a decision if we are going to believe in our heart and our mind and our soul that Jesus is exactly who he says he is, not just was, who he says he is, with all these people in the world still proclaiming their belief. And so Thomas, we get this sense that he is wrestling with his doubt, but I don't think it's fair just to call him doubting Thomas and dismiss it from there. I think Thomas is yearning and really truly wanting to believe, but he says he can't believe it unless he sees it. I gotta ask, have you been there? Can you relate to what it's like to say, I can't believe it unless I can see it with my own two eyes, unless I can experience it with the sense of touch. Or maybe it's something that you hear or you smell or you taste. I'm pulling out the five senses there. It's like, I can't believe it until I can sense it. The other disciples had the privilege and the gift of being able to sense Jesus Christ there with them in the flesh. And Thomas, without having the ability to see it or smell it or hear it or taste it or sense it, Thomas says, I've got, I've got to be able to see it to believe. I've been there. I mean, I think all of us have, right? I can remember one of the times I was struggling with faith and doubt. My dad made this really, really wise statement to me. I thought it was original to him. Maybe it was, but I, I've heard it several times in, a, in other iterations. Uh, but kind of similar to Doubting Thomas, or to Thomas, my dad would say, some people need to see in order to believe, but in reality, we need to believe in order to see. Some people need to see in order to believe, but in reality, we really need to believe in order to see. And so Jesus appears there with Thomas, and and he allows Thomas to touch the, uh, the wounds in his hands and his side, and, and, and Thomas believes. But then Jesus offers a blessing. And in some ways, we may hear it with a condescending tone. I don't think that's coming from Jesus. I think that's coming through our own filters. But we can sense what Jesus is saying. Blessed are those who are able to believe without having seen. Friends, that's you and me. That's, of course, if we're saying that we can only believe in Christ if we're able, like Thomas, to put our, our hands in his wounds or to be there in the flesh. But my goodness, think about the course of your life and how many times have you seen, have you experienced, have you felt the presence of God even though God may not be visibly there, right there in front of you, but you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that his presence is real. And his presence is power. And that presence, real and powerful, is available to you right where you sit, stand, kneel, lie, or whatever. God's presence is available to you. This becomes part of your witness that God wants you to testify to, that God wants you to testify about, to share your story, even in the face of doubts, but your story of belief and faith with people who need it so desperately. And I hope on this Sunday after Easter, as we all are dealing with our own sense of doubts, it may not be about God, it may not be about uh, Easter Sunday or Christ's resurrection, but maybe it's uh, doubting that we're going to be provided for with uh, our econ economic situation the way that it is, or not knowing we're going to be able to get back to work or even get back to church. We struggle, we worry, we wonder because of doubt. We just don't know. The power of faith enters into our lives and our bodies that say, you know what? Even if things don't always work out the way that you wanted them to, God's presence is going to be in the midst of it. That is the story of Easter. The expectations were not met, but Christ stood there right in the middle of them. 
And it was their testimony of what they witnessed with the resurrected Christ that has changed the world. It's changed our world forever. And so we've got to learn to deal with our doubts, to know that the powerful, personal presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is present with and for us in those times when it is just as real as anything else that we could sense, like the aroma of popcorn in a popcorn theater or of rain on a spring afternoon. It's just as present as that what we could see. Jesus wants us to experience the blessing of belief even in spite of the times when we are faced with wonder and with doubt. And so what I've done is I've, I've come up with, these aren't necessarily original to me, but I've come up with uh, five techniques to help us confront our doubt and put our faith into action, even in those times when we feel like we have to see something in order to believe it, so that hopefully we can get to that point where we believe something so that we can see it. We put our faith into action so that the action helps create that friction so that we move beyond that static sense of being paralyzed like we're in some locked room, even that locked room is our heart, mind, or soul or whatever, so that we can get moving for God. All right? So let's dig in together five techniques to help overcome doubt. The first simply says to have faith, not fear. If you're going to doubt something, doubt your limits. This is interesting. Have faith, not fear. If you're going to doubt something, doubt your limits. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago about how God commands us to be bold. Deuteronomy 31 6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. We get the promise of God's powerful presence made personally available for you. This is what God commanded in Deuteronomy as the Israelites are moving out of the Exodus journey and into the promised land. But it's the same promise that Christ gives as he's getting ready to ascend into heaven. He promises that I am with you to the very end of the age. Jesus' promise for boldness and courage that spans the Exodus journey to his ascension into heaven has everything to do with the fact that God's powerful presence is made personally available for you made personally available for you. And he goes on to say, if you're going to doubt something, doubt your limits. Now, one of the things that I've been doing during this corona quarantine is I've gone back and I've rewatched some of the Dark Knight trilogy movies. Do you like those? I, I love them. I love the idea in the sense of uh, how Batman could appear in, uh, in a real-world scenario. And so there's this one line in The Dark Knight, that's the one that has Heath Ledger as the Joker, where uh, Batman had just gotten torn up by a dog and he'd gotten beaten up and he's all these bruises and wounds and things. And his butler, Alfred, says, Master Wayne, you've got to know your limits. And, and, he's, and Wayne, uh, Bruce Wayne replies, well, I, I can't afford to know my limits because Batman doesn't have any limits. It's that sense of courage, of being that symbol of hope that Bruce Wayne as Batman knew that he needed to be for Gotham City. He said, I can't doubt my limits. I've got to keep putting myself out there boldly and courageously. He had faith, not fear. Now here's something that's interesting for you. Digging into some of my psycholo psychology, my psychological background. Some of you must say I'm psycho. I don't know. I'm not going there. But the psychology background did you know that faith and fear are processed in the same part of the brain? Think about that. Faith and fear are processed in the same part of the brain. Therefore, you have a choice to make, a decision to make. That when confronted with something that's going to make you scared or fearful, what you have to do is choose to act in faith, to believe in that powerful, personal, profound presence of Christ that's made available for you. So if you're going to doubt anything, Doubt your limits. And why is that? Because God himself knows no limits. The resurrected Christ, as I've already mentioned, was no longer bound by the laws of physics. He wants to make his personal, profound presence available to you right here and right now. He already has. The second step to help us deal with our doubts is to know that doubt can be removed by action. In other words, do something. In Colossians 3.23, we, we read where the Apostle Paul wrote, Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord. 
Paul's advice, his wisdom here, is to continuously be looking for ways to work and to serve other people with that love and the presence of God because the personal, profound uh, presence of Christ is available to you, even when your heart, mind, body, and soul seems locked by fear or paralysis. He's saying it's being made available to you, so do it. Work for God, even when you may feel scared to do something. What's that old line that says that courage isn't the absence of fear, but doing the right thing in the face of it? We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, But in terms of doing something and putting your faith into action, I'm taken to a scene from The Empire Strikes Back in Star Wars when Master Yoda is trying to get Luke Skywalker to raise the the X-Wing fighter. And he says, I'll try. And what is that famous line that Yoda retorts with? Try not. Do or do not. There is no try. Luke had doubts in his abilities, and then when Master Yoda raised the starship out of the swamp, Luke said, I can't believe it. And what was Yoda's response? That's why you failed. The key of the Scripture, the gospel, is that we are a a people on the go. We are a faith on the go. God wants you to put your faith over your fear and put your faith into action. And when you do things, when you step out, when you reach out, you'll see the personal, profound presence of God manifests within you and within the people with whom you are serving and doing life with. So the third point is don't invest in doubt because overthinking will never solve any problems. Don't invest in doubt because overthinking will never solve any problems. This brings to mind uh, Proverbs 4.23 where the where Solomon tells us, more than anything you guard, protect your mind, for life flows from it. We're fans of the TV show, The Big Bang Theory. I don't know if I can mention that. Can I mention that? Well, I just did, right? So we're fans of the show, The Big Bang Theory. And there's this one great episode, among many, where uh, one of the main characters, Sheldon Cooper, just gets paralyzed, paralyzed by overthinking. And it's something that, although it's comedic, I imagine many of us could probably relate to. The one episode in particular that I'm thinking about is the one where Sheldon is trying to decide between video game consoles, either the PlayStation 4 or the Xbox One. And the relationship that he has with Amy Farrah Fowler, uh, the entire episode is just consumed with Sheldon debating and deliberating which video game console that he wants. And it ends, by by the end of the day, the opportunity to buy the console is gone because he waited too long. Sheldon, much like where Thomas was, the disciples were locking themselves in the upper room. They found themselves locked and paralyzed because they were overthinking and they were fearful. And it was the presence of Christ that stood among them, that was manifest among them, that gave the disciples the strength and the power to be able to step out and proclaim the goodness of God that enabled them to get out so they didn't miss out on what God had in store for them. And we can get paralyzed, locked in our own heart, mind, body, and soul, like Sheldon Cooper, when we try to constantly deliberate and determine what is best for us. God says, go. Go do something. Put your faith into action. Help people know that I am real because I am really with you. Isn't that awesome? I think it's awesome. I think it's something that we've got to put our heart and our mind behind to unlock the paralysis that we feel from fear, and overthinking because of doubt. The fourth point that I want to pull out today is to make decisions from a position of love and not guilt. Now think about that. Make decisions from a position of love and not guilt. So far we've talked a lot about doubt and fear as something that locks us within our experience of life and living, but guilt plays a major role in this too. Guilt is where those coulda, woulda, shouldas begin to just bubble up in our heart, mind, and soul. It's like, well, I should have called that person a month ago. I could call them now, but, well, if I would, they'd say, well, why didn't you call sooner? So I'm just not going to call at all. We feel guilty because of the things that we've done or maybe the things that we haven't done. We get guilty because of the things that we've said or the things that we haven't said. We get guilty because of places that we've been or the places that we haven't been. We feel ourselves locked and trapped by guilt. 
And so we could allow our lives to be locked up by that guilt, or we can turn them loose. We can set them free. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, the first part of that verse, John wrote, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. There is no fear in love, because, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Now think about fear and guilt almost interchangeably here. Guilt has to do with punishment. We end up punishing ourselves because of the things that we fear. Someone else may think about us or say about us or do without us because of how we've messed up and fallen short in the past. But love motivates us to action, not to guilt. The Julia Roberts movie, Eat, Pray, Love, deals with this in some pretty unique ways. As her life has been upended and upheaval has overcome her, she, you know, she goes to try to find herself. But she is locked within the sense of an inability to love because of guilt. She doesn't know if she can love herself, let alone learn to love anyone else. And so she's locked in that prison of guilt. At the end of the movie... She picks a one word. Maybe I've done that here. I've done it before. We pick one word to try to help define and, and guide to direct thoughts and movements and actions. And she chooses one word. If you're a fan of the movie, do you know what it is? I'm giving you space in your living room or kitchen, wherever you may be to answer. But her one word is cross over. Cross over. She's crossing over from fear and guilt, and a sense of punishment, albeit self-inflicted. She's crossing over from fear and guilt and self-inflicted punishment to a life of love. Friends, that's what Jesus is asking you and me to do today. Throughout this Easter season, to cross over from an experience and an expression of fear or guilt or paralysis, to cross over from that into living a life of love. And so that, take that word crossover and let's apply it to our, our other three points. To cross over from fearing our limits into living boldly with God because God is with us. To cross over in that sense. To cross over from the paralysis of doubt into doing something for God because God is with you and has done something for you, the ultimate something, right? To cross over from that. To cross over in investing in doubt and overthinking into faith. Guarding the mind and allowing life to do what? To flow from us. To cross over from paralysis and inaction or inactivity because of fear or guilt and self-inflicted punishment. To cross over from that into a life of love. Investing in God and investing in His people. So I hope we are all choosing today to make a decision not out of guilt, but out of love. A decision to step up and to step out and say, God, use me. Even in this time when we are socially, socially distancing and we're sheltering in place, help me to step up and to step out for you. There are ways that I can use technology and the relationships right here at my disposable, disposable, I'm sorry, disposal to be a person for you. Make that choice out of love, not fear. But our last point calls us to once again recognize that fear can be real and choose to cross over as a result. And that fifth point is to not be afraid to fail. To not be afraid to fail. It's one of those things that even putting myself out there, so to speak, and I'm speaking more universally, right, but putting myself out there, I'm afraid of failing? What if people don't like me or think I'm good enough or smart enough or, you know, whatever, that's the Stuart Smalley from Saturday Night Live. You're good enough, you're smart enough, and people like you, right? I digress. But it's about not being afraid to fail. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 through 14, Paul wrote, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything in love. I'm going to read that again because it is chock full of awesome. Be on your guard, 
Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything in love. You've noticed that every point has uh, a movie or TV show reference that goes along with it. The fifth one doesn't have, I mean, isn't any different from that. It comes from the Will Smith movie, After Earth. There is this incredible exchange that the older Will Smith character has with the younger version of himself. And he says these words, which really, really intrigue me. And I want you to hear them and take them in your heart, mind, body, and soul today in light of Paul's commandment to be, to be on your guard, stand firm, be courageous, be strong, and do everything in love. Listen to what Will Smith's character in After Earth says. Fear is not real. Danger is real. But fear is a choice. Remember what I said earlier about fear and faith are processed in the same part of the brain? Fear is a choice to choose fear over faith. Danger is real, but fear is a choice. He goes on to say the only place it can live is in our thoughts of the future. It is a product of our imagination causing us to fear things that are not in our future and may never exist. In other words, fear is a projection of what could be in the future but isn't known to be. What we do know beyond the shadow of a, of a doubt is that Jesus is in your future. He's in our future as a church. He's in all of our futures. And there's no reason for us to be afraid because Christ is there. And for that reason, we can be bold. We can be courageous. We can stand strong in the presence of God knowing that He is already there. He goes before us. And we can choose, even though there may be danger ahead of us, to move forward not in fear but in faith because Christ Jesus is already there. Boom. Think about that, friends. Fear is a choice. And there's no need to fear. Because fear is a projection of what may be in the future. There's no need to fear because we know who is already there. Our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we may, like Thomas, feel at times, and it's totally natural, totally normal, totally human, to say, oh, I know you're there, Lord, but I've got, I've got to feel it. I've got to sense it. I've got to smell it or taste it or hear it or whatever. But to know with assurance that Jesus is already there, conquering the things that frighten us so that we can move forward in fear. I'm, we can move forward in faith. See, I caught myself. Glory be to God. Amen. So we have a choice. We're all dealing with doubts. We have a choice to make. Will we allow our lives, our minds, our very spirits and presence to be consumed with fear, guilt, self-inflicted punishment? Or will we allow the forgiveness that Christ accomplished on the cross all those years ago to stand in the place of the punishment that we deserve, to know that we can stand up and we can be strong and we can be courageous and we can move forward in faith because Christ has already conquered the worst thing that could ever happen to us. And now even with the wounds in his hands and in his side, he stands here with us in our midst, in our presence, even though we may be connected through video screens and video cameras. He stands with us to connect us, not just with our future, but with our eternity. And he stands between us and any danger that may come our way. So my friends, I want to ask you again today, will you choose faith over fear, belief over, over doubt, love, over guilt, or self-inflicted punishment? Will you guard your mind and allow your thoughts and your actions to flow forth from you so that other people may come to know that God is real, that God loves them and has, an, has a plan and purpose for their lives? I pray you do. But maybe now you need to hear that for yourself. So hear now this invitation. If you've yet to receive the love and the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to break that paralysis, to be belief over, over doubt or faith over fear, 
Don't let this moment pass you by as an opportunity to choose to live for Christ. You may be sitting here thinking, I've got to see it in order to believe it. Well, what if I told you like my dad did for me all those years ago, that you've got to believe it in order to see it. My friends, I pray that you will. Or maybe you made that commitment in the past, but got off the path days or decades ago. I want you to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the Lord Jesus Christ, with his nail-scarred hands, is still standing with his arms wide open, welcoming you into his presence and offering you the blessings of belief that come even in the face of our fear, of our doubt, and our self-inflicted punishment. I hope and pray that you will allow this day, this moment, this Sunday after Easter, to be a time when you choose faith over fear, when you choose belief over doubt, when you choose love and grace over guilt and self-inflicted punishment. And I hope that you will allow it to change your life, that your life may be an agent for change in a world so desperately in need of it. As always, I am here for you and with you. If there's anything I can do to be of assistance for you as you work through these times when life is just different, but we still have opportunities and responsibilities to be the, the hands and feet of Christ in the world, scarred though they may be, but examples of love and grace and strength and forgiveness for a world that needs it so much. If I can be assistance to you, don't hesitate to reach out to me. You can email me at mark at placeofhope.org. Again, that's mark at placeofhope.org. And it would be my deep, deep pleasure and delight to talk with you, to meet with you, to over telephone, FaceTime, Zoom, Skype, whatever, so that we can just connect and experience that strength that comes from choosing belief over doubt and faith over fear and love over guilt and self-inflicted punishment. Will you join me in prayer, please? Living and loving God, I give you thanks for this day, and I give you thanks for this place where hope is being made manifest in your name and in your image. And Lord, though our chairs may be empty right now, we know that our lives are full with your grace, with your love, with your mercy, and your forgiveness. Lord, if there are those here today who are hearing this message who need to be filled with your presence, I pray, Lord, that they may open their eyes and believe, not because they have seen, but they may see because they believe that your presence is real and that they may choose belief over doubt, that they may choose faith over fear, and they may choose love over a sense of guilt or self-inflicted punishment because of choices or mistakes made in the past, whether they are ours or someone else's. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray on this Sunday after Easter that we may take seriously the time and the opportunity that we have here today to reflect upon who you are and who you want us to be in the world because of you. So may we experience your presence and your power in a personal and profound way today, and may we go live that out in ways that are unique to us, but magnify your presence and glorify your name in all the earth. And I ask this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you for joining us today here at Hope Church Online. Go with God. Go in hope. Go to love. And may it be so for a great week. Amen.